You don't need to be a clairvoyant to see your bright future before it happens, and in fact, it's very easy to do. Confused? You won't be after you've seen this video. Now, most people believe that we think in thoughts. That is to say, we have an inner monologue that works like the thought bubbles in comic books. Recently, though, more research suggests that we think in lots of modalities. Sometimes we visualize. Sometimes we imagine our bodies doing something and almost feel what we're thinking. And sometimes we just know. And this latter example is called unsymbolized thought. In fact, thinking with our bodies and our senses might just be what enabled us to develop thought in the first place. Now, briefly, embodied cognition is the idea that all our thoughts eventually relate back to physical experience. So, you can imagine something because you've done it. When someone says something to you, or when you think something, your brain interprets this in such a way that it gives it meaning. You don't inherently understand language, which means the brain must be translating it into some kind of pure meaning. Psychologists once believed that the brain had a language of its own that they called mental ease. More recently, though, more and more experts adopted the belief that we understand things by visualizing them. When someone tells you a story, you understand the story because your brain visualizes it happening to you. Now, when somebody tells you that they walked along the beach, you visualize the color of the sand. You imagine the sea breeze on your skin and you almost hear the sound of the waves breaking. When we think higher level thoughts, we understand them only because we can relate them back to our own physical experiences via abstraction. Maths, after all, is fundamentally based on counting. This is also consistent with the idea that areas of our brain light up during visualization, just as though we are really engaging in the action. So, if you imagine yourself swinging a golf club, then the neurons relating to that movement will fire in your brain, and as far as your brain and body is concerned, it might as well be happening. Don't believe that visualization can trick your brain into thinking something is happening and thereby alter your emotional state? Well, just try reliving some of your most upsetting moments or imagining scenes from a very sad movie, and you'll start to feel incredibly sad in no time. So, how can you use this power of visualization to improve your productivity or to help you achieve your goals? Well, there are a number of different ways. The best way is just to imagine what it will feel like to achieve your goals. Create a detailed mental image of the desired outcome using all of your senses. For example, if your goal is to lose weight, Imagine what it will be like to put on a pair of jeans in your desired smaller size. Imagine what it will feel like to walk down the street wearing them. Think of the compliments you'll get from friends and family. Imagine how good that's going to feel. The anticipation of getting the desired result can act as an incentive for you to go out and achieve the goal. You can't wait to experience those feelings for real. Now visualize the opposite. Imagine it all going wrong and then remember why it matters. You can do the same thing with almost anything you're struggling to focus on. By linking what you're doing back to the emotional hook and the reason that you're doing it, you can much more effectively find the determination and drive that you need to complete it. Keep your goals in mind and you'll be much more motivated every day to get out of bed and start working out or to work on your personal project or to practice your musical instrument or to put in your very best performance at your work. 
In this video, I want to talk about reprogramming your brain using a technique called CBT. Now, what is CBT? Well, CBT stands for Cognitive Behavioural Therapy. And according to the UK's National Health Service, Cognitive Behavioural Therapy, otherwise known as CBT, is a talking therapy that can help you manage your problems by changing the way you think and behave. It's most commonly used to treat anxiety and depression, but it can be useful for other mental and physical health problems. Now, before you start thinking that because I'm using words like therapy and mental health, I'm implying that you must be some gibbering, straitjacket-wearing nutjob who needs to be locked up in a padded cell for his or own protection, like our friend here, uh, to benefit from CBT, nothing could be further from the truth. Everyone can benefit from introducing CBT into their lives. CBT is based on the concept that your thoughts, feelings, physical sensations and actions are interconnected and that negative thoughts and feelings can trap you in a vicious cycle. CBT aims to help you deal with problems in a more positive way by breaking them down into smaller parts. And it looks for practical ways to improve your state of mind on a daily basis. So, how does CBT work in practice? Well, generally, it involves several steps and several different techniques that, when combined, allow you to control the way that you think and feel. The start is to identify the way you feel and what you're thinking when you're doing something. And one technique is to use mindfulness meditation. Simply by choosing not to let your thoughts and emotions affect you, you can become less controlled by them and less susceptible to your own fears and negative thoughts. Just empty your brain and concentrate on the here and now and what's going on around you. But at the same time, when the thoughts do start to creep in, you're going to make a note of them so you can try and change them. And this technique is called journaling. And what you do is you write down the feelings as they come to you, or you can write them in a journal at the end of the day. The next steps fall under the category of cognitive restructuring, and you can think of this as reprogramming yourself. And the first is thought challenging. Now, Thought challenging is simple. It means that you're looking at all those thoughts that you made a note of and now you're challenging them and testing whether or not you think they're really true. So if you're afraid of public speaking, it may be that you think things like, I'm going to stutter and everyone will laugh at me. In thought challenging, we're going to deconstruct that belief and see if it really is likely or if it's anything to really be afraid of. So ask yourself, why would you stutter? Do you normally stutter when you talk? Why would people laugh at you? Are people usually that unkind? Would you laugh if someone had a hard time giving a speech? Or would you be more sympathetic and understanding than that? Does it matter? If you aren't going to see these people again, why does it matter what they think of you? Ask yourself these things and focus on the fact that the worst case scenario really isn't all that bad. Once you can start doing that, you'll see there's nothing to be afraid of. You can even repeat a maxim to yourself as a positive affirmation. It really doesn't matter what these people think of me. It really doesn't matter what these people think of me. You can think that to yourself over and over again. Hypothesis testing can be one of the most unpleasant and upsetting parts of CBT, but it's also by far one of the most immediately effective. The idea is that you're looking at those fears that you have and then you're going to test if they're true. 
Now, let me give you an example from my own experience. When I was a boy, I had a terrible fear of escalators. I used to have this terrible feeling that when I got to the end, you know, where it disappears underneath and rolls round, that it was going to chop my feet off. Or that if I was going up the escalator, a shoelace or a piece of clothing would get snagged in the escalator itself or in the handrail. And then when we got to the end, it would rip my arm off or rip my leg off. I mean, I didn't realize that escalators do have fail safe devices built in to stop that happening. So every time I went anywhere and there was an option to use the stairs instead of the escalator, I always took that. And the more I avoided escalators, the worse my fear and my phobia got. Well, one day, um, I suppose I was about 10 years old, and I went up into central London with my parents and we took a journey on the London Underground on the Tube. And we went on the Bakerloo line. And for those who are familiar with the London Underground, you'll know that this is actually one of the deeper lines on the system. And getting on the train was fine because at the station that we got on at, uh, there was a lift, um, an elevator. But when we got to our destination station, the only way out was up the escalators. And it was really crowded, I remember, and we were sort of pushed on by the crowd. And when we got to the bottom of the escalator, and I didn't want to go up, and there was no other way of getting up, though, and somebody, probably my mother, I suspect, gave me a hefty shove in the back and pushed me onto the escalator. And it was a really long escalator, like the one in this picture. And I was absolutely petrified all the way up. And then we got to the end... And I had to get off, and guess what? Nothing happened. I was perfectly all right. It didn't chop my feet off or rip my arm off or any of the other phobias that I had. It was absolutely okay. And then, of course, when we were going home, I had to go down the escalator to get back on the train. So I had to repeat the whole process all over again. And we got to the bottom, and everything was fine. I you know, still had both legs attached and nothing had fallen off and I hadn't been badly injured and my fear and phobia was proved to be absolutely groundless. Now, although I didn't realize it at the time, what I was doing was hypothesis testing. My parents and everybody else using the escalator knew that nothing bad was going to happen. And deep down inside, I probably knew that too. All I needed was to have the hypothesis put to the test. And it worked, and my fear of escalators vanished. And when I grew up, I worked in central London for many years, and I used to go up two flights of escalators at Tottenham Court Road tube station every day, and I had absolutely no trouble at all. Now, obviously, you have to use some caution here. You don't want to test your fear of heights hypothesis by jumping off a bridge because you'll probably die. But going up to the observation deck of a skyscraper isn't going to do you any harm. You can use CBT to improve your life. You can use CBT to overcome any phobia or any problem. So if you're afraid of heights, assess why and then address those fears and reprogram the way that you think about them. If you find you're not great at meeting other people, you can practice in your mind and force yourself to face those fears. And you can take CBT further too and impact on other areas of your life. For example, if you're someone who struggles to get to sleep, you'll know it can impact on every other aspect of your life, leaving you tired and stressed. The problem well, the later it gets, the more stressed and anxious you become. And the solution is to apply a little CBT. This time, the focus is going to be on identifying your thought processes and seeing what would be more useful in that given moment. The problem is trying to force yourself to sleep. Now, when you do this, 
you create stress and then when you're stressed of course you can't sleep so instead try reminding yourself that it doesn't matter if you get to sleep as long as you're resting resting is good for you no matter what so just lie down and enjoy being comfortable focus on it and you'll be asleep in minutes you can also use cbt to deal with stress actually stress is not really one thing instead it's a spectrum of responses that occur in response to dangerous situations it all harks back to your inner caveman or inner cave woman and the part of your brain responsible for triggering the fight or flight mechanism now if you were attacked by a woolly mammoth or a saber-toothed tiger you'd either want to fight it kill it and eat it or flee from it before it killed and ate you and this function still has a use in our modern world you know if your house was on fire you would need to trigger this mechanism to get away fast likewise if a mugger had you cornered you may have to fight him off and escape the trouble is not everything we perceive as dangerous is dangerous deep down inside we know this so we ignore it and this conflict with one part of your brain saying this is dangerous and the other part of your brain saying no it isn't causes us to be stressed now of course some stress can be good for you if you're up against a deadline at work or you're studying for an exam at school then stress can spur you on to achieve your full potential so the solution in dealing with stress is to step back from the situation and examine it logically are you really in any immediate danger what's the worst thing that can happen how realistic is the worst case scenario now when you do this chances are that your stress levels will go down because you'll start thinking logically rather than using your gut instinct your caveman cavewoman fight or flight mechanism and you can also use a mantra to help you reprogram your mind to overcome the stress as well now exactly what you use will depend on the situation but you should reassure yourself that the situation isn't dangerous and you should keep calm and carry on in addition to dealing with stress cbt is incredibly effective for treating anxiety attacks now ironically one of the biggest dangers with anxiety attacks is that they make us stressed because we're stressed about anxiety this makes us become even more stressed and we work ourselves up into a fluster that can end with fainting and hyperventilation not good the solution well just acknowledge it for what it is and allow it to pass say to yourself this is an anxiety attack i must let it run its course and then you just allow it to happen and go about your business as you normally would and don't try to do anything about it you can also do something similar when trying to be less stressed generally especially when you're trying to calm yourself before a first date or before an interview instead of worrying about being stressed just remind yourself that some stress can be good for you something else that's very powerful that you can use is to apply a gratitude attitude now this is a bit like cbt except in this case you're not trying to combat a fear or stress instead you're simply going to change your focus again and this time you're focusing on what makes you happy and what you're grateful for and this is a great change because a lot of us are so caught up in everything that's wrong we never think about how much is right so take a moment at the end of each day and write down the things that you're grateful for your spouse maybe your job your house your cat the computer game you're playing you know, write it all down and be grateful 
because there's so much to be happy about, but a lot of the time we miss it. So take your new ability to change the way you think and focus on it. And suddenly everything becomes happier. In this video, I want to talk about how you can become more mindful because becoming more mindful is a key way of reprogramming your brain to be more successful. Now, of course, the big question is, what is mindfulness? Well, essentially, mindfulness is a form of meditation that has been adopted by CBT. CBT, in turn, is Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. And it's a psychotherapeutic approach used to treat conditions like anxiety, phobias, addictions, etc. And the fact that this is a form of meditation can put some people off. They think it's all new age and something hippies used to do in the 1960s when they weren't smoking dope, driving around in VW microbuses and calling everybody mad. Others associate it with religion, like Buddhism, for example, and think that taking it up might compromise their own religious faith. And then there are people who aren't religious at all and don't want to be associated with it for that reason. In fact, nothing could be further from the truth. You can practice meditation whether you are a religious person or an atheist. All meditation really is, is a directed attempt to control your thoughts and the contents of your mind. And in so doing, you can gain some peace and quiet, or at least be able to better understand the contents of your own brain. So meditation essentially gives us a tool we can use, not only to calm our thoughts and escape the stresses of the day, but also to reflect on the contents of our mind in the interests of self-improvement. And, well, that's all it is, really. Often, meditation means completely silencing all thoughts. And many types of meditation, such as transcendental meditation, instruct you to think of absolutely nothing. Often, this is achieved by focusing on your breathing, or a mantra, or a physical object like a candle flame. And this can be difficult for beginners, though, as they constantly find their mind wandering. Well, the idea behind mindfulness meditation is not to try and empty your thoughts, but instead to simply step back from them and observe them like a detached third party. And this way, you aren't letting your thoughts affect you and make you stressed out, but you also aren't going to struggle with not being allowed to think of anything. And using this technique will also allow you to become more aware of your own thoughts. And in so doing, you'll be able to edit any thoughts that are leading you into trouble. Now, this may be the long-term aim of mindfulness when used in CBT. In the short term, however, we're simply going to use it to remove ourselves from our thoughts and emotions and get some calm and recover, ready to tackle the day ahead. So let's look at some of the practical ways that you can use mindfulness in your daily life. In this case, mindfulness simply means being mindful of what you're focusing on and what you're thinking about at any given point. And this is useful because very often you'll find that your mind isn't perhaps where it should be. For example, if you're walking through beautiful countryside but you're thinking about your work, then, as far as your body is concerned, you may as well be at work. In this case, mindfulness can be used simply to make yourself more aware of where you are and to focus on what's actually going on around you. This means feeling the breeze on your skin, looking at the beautiful flowers and smelling the fresh air. When you do all that, you'll benefit much more from the experience. You can then use mindfulness to direct your attention to all manner of other things. For example, your physical sensations. 
you know, quite often we aren't aware of just how we're sitting, how we're standing, or how we're feeling. So take a moment right now to reflect on this. How comfortable are you at the moment? Does any part of your body hurt? If you're sitting down, where's the most pressure on you? Can you feel your clothes against your body? A watch, maybe. How warm are you? Are you leaning more to one side or another? This kind of mindfulness can be useful if you want to try and fix your posture, but also if you want to improve your abilities in sports or just move more efficiently. Being mindful of the way you speak can also help you to speak more eloquently, to stop using derogatory words, to stop swearing, or to change the whole way that people perceive you. For example, if you want to sound more intelligent, you can simply try using bigger words or speaking a little more slowly. You can also use mindfulness to be happier in everyday life. Simply try to stop letting negative emotions affect you by identifying them as temporary and destructive. You can simply notice that you're getting angry and acknowledge that your thoughts will be tainted by that. With practice, this can make you a much calmer, a much happier person. But what do you find when you try and do this? In all likelihood, you'll find that you forget. And this is just like the same way you forget to pick up a pint of milk when your spouse asks you to. And it's the same way you forget to take back a library book every once in a while. Most of the time we have no control over what we're focused on or paying attention to. We find ourselves forgetting things, getting into bad habits or stressing when we should be enjoying ourselves. Practicing mindfulness, both as a form of meditation and during the day, can help to improve your ability to control your thoughts and decide how you want to improve yourself and what you want to focus on. When conditioning your mind for success, sometimes it's hard to break old habits and change everything at once. And that's where Kaizen and the Law of Attraction come in. Let's look at each of them in turn. Kaizen is Japanese for improvement. And when used in the business sense and applied to the workplace, Kaizen refers to activities that continuously improve all functions and involve all employees from the CEO to the assembly line workers. When used generally in your life, it can mean lots of little changes that add up to one very big change. It might mean breaking bad habits one step at a time, or achieving a main goal by achieving lots of little goals along the way. So, let's say your goal is to quit smoking. Well, your first step will be to stop smoking cigarettes and start using patches and chewing nicotine gum. Then you gradually cut down the patches and finally you reduce the amount of gum. And each step along the way leads you closer to reaching your goal of quitting smoking and eliminating your addiction to nicotine. Another example would be learning to play a musical instrument. As you practice, you slowly get better and improve your performance. Now, Toyota, the car manufacturer and big Japanese conglomerate, have taken this to a whole new level. The Toyota production system is known for Kaizen, 
where all line personnel are expected to stop their moving production line in case of any abnormality and, along with their supervisor, suggest an improvement to resolve the abnormality which may initiate a Kaizen. And they actually do this in um, a way that's also known as the Schuhart cycle, Deming cycle, or PDCA. And you start with plan. So you plan what you're going to do, and you do it. Then you check it, and then you act. That's the PDCA. Now, in between do and check, there's also another cycle that you go through. You start with problem finding, display, clear, and acknowledge. And this whole thing is a continuous loop, or two intersecting continuous loops. So as soon as you've completed the last step, which is act, immediately you're starting to plan again. So you're planning the next step. So plan, do, check, problem, find, display, clear, acknowledge, act, and then plan and on to the next step. And the whole thing is a continuous cycle over and over and over again. So it's a continuous improvement with every step of the way. Now consider the law of attraction. This states that like attracts like, and if you act in a certain way, your life will change to match. When applied to health, the law of attraction states that worry, fear, stress, or other negative thoughts can make people sick, while positive thoughts of wellness or love can keep people healthy and even cure illnesses. And this can be seen in scientific studies where the placebo effect takes place. Those who receive fake sugar pills tend to become healthier due to the mere fact that they think they're getting treatment when they aren't. Proponents also claim that an important part of maintaining health and curing illnesses is to be able to visualize yourself as being healthy. In finance, it's claimed that if someone consistently thinks prosperous thoughts, then irrespective of their actual situation, they will experience prosperity in the future because like attracts like. Conversely, if a person consistently thinks they are poor, then that will be their future experience. Law of attraction proponents claim that it affects our relationships because whatever we focus on, we experience more of. So if an individual focuses on another person's good qualities, then they experience more of those. Whereas if they focus on what they dislike about that person, those will be the characteristics of that person they experience. They also claim that if you can visualize that a certain person is being nice to you, then you'll be attracting experiences to match those thoughts. When it comes to ambitions and things you want out of life generally, it's claimed that when someone visualizes clearly and in detail what they want to achieve and focuses upon that image, they set in motion through the law of attraction a chain of events which eventually culminates in the materialization of that vision. So act confidently, dress well, look great, and people start taking you more seriously. You then start to be given more responsibility at work and your career improves. You make more money, enabling you to live a healthier lifestyle. This makes you more attractive to the opposite sex, and your life generally becomes better. When combining Kaizen and the Law of Attraction, it brings changes to all areas of your life and facilitates improvements across the board. One of the things that all of us have to do in life at some point is to overcome obstacles. And it's how you approach the situations and how you devise strategies and tactics to overcome those obstacles and achieve success that separates people who are really successful from the also-rans in the rest of the community. 
when I was at school, one of my teachers had a poster on his classroom wall, and it said, "When life gives you lemons, make lemonade." And it took me a while to figure out what the poster was really saying, because you know, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. Well, what if you don't like lemonade? But really, the message of the poster was that you need to make the best out of what you've got. You can't always have a smooth situation. Sometimes you might have some lemons. Well, you need to do something about that. And the way to do that is to make lemonade. And every obstacle can be turned into an opportunity. You just have to learn how to approach it differently to most people, and this takes creativity and perseverance. And in fact, some of the most successful people on the planet have had to overcome obstacles that would finish off most people. And often this involves thinking outside the box. Now, according to Wikipedia, thinking outside the box, also known as thinking out of the box or thinking beyond the box, and especially in Australia, thinking outside the square, is a metaphor that means to think differently, unconventionally, or from a new perspective. And this phrase often refers to novel or creative thinking. The term is thought to derive from management consultants in the 1970s and 1980s, challenging their clients to solve the nine dots puzzle, whose solution requires some lateral thinking. Now, basically, as you can see on the screen here, you have a grid of nine dots, and the goal of the puzzle is to link all nine dots using four straight lines or fewer, without lifting the pen. And without tracing the same line more than once. So, how would you solve this puzzle? Pause the video now and give it a go. Did you have a try? Well, here's one solution, and you'll notice it involves thinking outside the box. The instructions say you've got to use four lines or less. They don't say that you can't go over the edge. Anyway, back to what I was saying earlier about successful people overcoming obstacles. Did you know, for example, that when Thomas Edison's laboratory and factory burned to the ground, he didn't do what most people would do and go, "Oh no, that's it, I'm finished." Instead, he saw the opportunity to rebuild and make it newer and better. And this enabled him to take advantage of new technologies, many of which he'd invented, and go on to make even greater discoveries. Bill Gates' first business went bust, so raising finance for his next venture must have been a real obstacle. You know, you go to the bank manager and ask for a loan, and they want to know what your experience is in business, and you say, "Well, my first company went bankrupt with massive debts," and the bank manager will say, "Thank you very much," and show you out the door. So obviously, it took a lot of ingenuity for him to actually. Find the money to start his new venture、uh, to overcome that obstacle, and of course, the new venture was Microsoft, and it went on to make him a multi-billionaire. But for a lot of people, the fact that they've had one business and it's gone under、uh, that is going to make them, you know, a credit risk as far as conventional finance is concerned, and they won't be able to overcome that obstacle if they follow the conventional route. Oprah Winfrey got fired from her first job as a local TV station because the producer thought she was unfit for television, which is hardly a glowing reference. So she had another big obstacle to overcome when she tried to get another job at another TV station. And if you've ever been fired from a job, you know that it is actually very difficult to find another one in the same line of work when you can't get a reference and your previous boss thinks you weren't any good. James Dyson got fed up with his vacuum cleaner losing suction when the bag got full, but he went through over five thousand prototypes before he perfected his bagless vacuum cleaner. Now, 
I could go on, but I think you get the picture. Now, sometimes brainstorming is the best way to come up with ideas and overcome obstacles. In a brainstorming session, a group of people get together and try to come up with as many ideas as possible. Everything, no matter how silly it might seem, gets written down. And actually, sometimes coming up with a silly idea that you know isn't going to be taken any further can spur other people in the room to come up with actually a really good idea because your silly idea gets them thinking. Now, all these ideas get whittled down to a few good ideas or solutions that are researched further, and the best idea is acted on or put into practice. And the best thing to do in a brainstorming session? You guessed it. Think outside the box. In this video, I want to talk you through designing your ideal lifestyle. And this is something that so many people get the wrong way round. Now, all this comes down to lifestyle design. Well, what is lifestyle design? Well, basically, lifestyle design means choosing the job that will give you the lifestyle that you want. That means not assuming that your job needs to dictate your lifestyle. For example, if you want to build muscles and become very strong because weightlifting or bodybuilding is the most important thing in your life, you could get a job on a construction site. You'll get plenty of fresh air and exercise, and the constant lifting will build your muscles. The money tends to be pretty good, and you'll also save a fortune in gym memberships. If your main desire is to travel, you can get a job with an airline. Cabin crew jobs, especially on long-haul flights, give you the opportunity to travel to far-flung places. Airlines also offer subsidised or even free travel to ground-based employees, so a job in reservations, publicity or even the accounts department could give you the opportunity to do a lot of travelling in your spare time. If flexibility is what you crave, then working online is probably for you. You can provide a service freelance, sell a digital product via your website or blog, run a drop shipping business on eBay or a combination of all of them. You set your own hours and you can even travel the world as a digital nomad. All you need is your laptop, a good Wi-Fi connection and you're set to go. You can work from anywhere, anytime you please. The thing is, don't be afraid to be different. This may mean doing a manual job that lets you get fresh air and exercise. Or it might mean doing a job like rubbish collection that lets you work better hours. The problem people have with this is it's not what they're used to. Too often we feel like we need to live a certain lifestyle in order to live up to what's expected of us or to be, in quotes, normal. And even if you'd be happier as a construction worker, you might go ahead and become an accountant to keep your family happy or to feel as though you're a success. And this is a mistake and your happiness is what should always come first. Likewise, you shouldn't be afraid to be a little unusual. You know, maybe you want to combine careers in a way that's not particularly common and that onlookers would find strange, but that's fine, really. Don't be afraid to be the first. The fact that you're happy with the lifestyle that you're leading is really what matters. In this video, I want to talk you through how you can become more present and become more involved in things that are going around you and in everything that you do. Now, how can you do this? Well, one method is to start focusing on your body and on your senses a little more. The fact of the matter is that most of us are so in our own heads that we barely notice half of what's going on around us. 
We walk in a dream state, worrying about work or about relationships, and we hardly take time to stop and smell the roses, either literally or metaphorically. So try this right now. Turn off any music that you're listening to, and instead just start to notice the sounds around you. I mean, really, really listen. What can you hear? Well, chances are, if there's a road somewhere near you, you're going to hear traffic noise. If you're listening to this at home、uh, or watching this at home, chances are you're going to hear noises from next door or perhaps from another room. You might hear people talking, music playing, somebody's TV set on, that sort of thing. All sort of subtle things in the background. If you're Watching this at work, then you might hear other conversations going on in the room, other people talking, or in adjacent offices, or perhaps you're doing this in somewhere that manufactures stuff, and you can hear the machines working. You can probably hear telephones ringing, or perhaps a photocopier whirring away if you're in an office. That sort of thing.、Uh, you might even hear some sounds from the outside, like a road or Um, a police car or an ambulance going by—that's the sort of thing that you might hear in the distance. And if you're outside, then you're going to hear all sorts of noises. You're going to hear birds singing. You might hear a dog barking. You might hear snippets of people's conversation as they're walking by. All sorts of different things that you're going to hear, which probably you tune out、uh, if you're thinking about something else as you're going through your life. Through your daily routine, and likewise, you can probably smell a whole load of things that you hadn't noticed. And if you take the moment to feel your own body, then you can probably notice the sensation of the seat pushing into your legs and into your buttocks. Maybe you can feel the blood filling your face and making you feel hot. Or perhaps there's a wind blowing against you. Is it hot or cold? What direction is it coming from? Listen to the sounds of your own breathing too, and feel your abdomen expand and shrink as you do. And once you do this, you'll find that you stop worrying about what's going on around you and start to appreciate your environment a little more. You know, there's so much. That we normally miss. You can try doing this on walks too. You know, go for a walk with no music, no phone, and nothing else, and try just being present and noticing the world around you. It's calming and invigorating at the same time. Practicing being more present in conversation is important because eventually it'll become something that you can just engage in at will. Now you can choose when you want to start listening better to people and digest what they're really saying. You can listen to them rather than the monologue going on in your head, and again you can leave your other concerns behind. Try focusing on the sensations of your body more the next time that you're being intimate with a sexual partner. You'll find that you instinctively know what to do next, and you'll start to be much more passionate and responsive. You'll become a better lover simply by getting out of your own head, and you'll feel it far more forcefully. This is true for everything else as well. You know, next time you have a bath or go for a swim. Take a moment to really appreciate the warmth and the softness of the water against your skin. Next time you eat your breakfast on a weekend morning, remind yourself how much you enjoy that food and how happy you are not to be going to work that particular morning. And this is what so many of us don't do. So many of us walk around in a dream state, worrying about other things. You know, we actually miss what's going on around us. And being stressed and having no control over your mind is doubly problematic because not only does it make us unhappy, 
but it also distracts us from the things that are going on all around us all the time that could be making us happier. And what it does for our relationships is also fantastic. Right now, being distracted could well be destroying your relationships with family and friends. Avoiding negativity is very important if you want to be successful because being in a negative atmosphere can simply drain all the energy out of you and especially being around negative people can be absolutely soul destroying. Here in the UK there's a comedian called Harry Enfield and he does lots of different characters and one of them is this guy who's incredibly negative and finds fault with everything and corrects everybody and he has this sort of irritating little nasally voice and he goes you don't want to do it like that all the time and ever somebody does something oh, you don't want to do it like that you want to do it like this and he does this over and over and over again and I suppose we've all met people like this in our lives, and I'm sure Harry Enfield probably based him on a couple of people that he knew, perhaps, I don't know. But we've all met people like this, and they're just the sort of people that you have a strong urge to hit repeatedly with something heavy and blunt. And they probably go, oh, you don't want to hit me with a baseball bat. You want to use a bit of lead pipe. All right, mate, if that's what you want, that's what we'll do. But, you know, it just can be really, really irritating and really soul destroying because they'll find something wrong or suggest an alternative with just about everything. So in this video, I'm going to give you five ways to avoid negative people or more specifically to avoid letting negative people drag you down into their pit of negativity. And way number one is to take responsibility. You know, stop being a victim of these negative people. Go from blaming, judging and criticizing to assuming full responsibility for your own thoughts and feelings. You know, when someone says, you don't want to do it like that, well, actually, yes, I do, because if I didn't want to do it like that, I wouldn't be doing it, would I? So take a different approach to how you deal with their negativity and don't respond in kind. You know, negativity feeds off itself. Way number two is to avoid complainers. Now, people who complain about everything will never enhance your life. You know, they're not looking for solutions. They just want to do nothing and moan. In fact, if you offer a solution, they'll find something wrong with it. And if you point out an obvious solution, they won't thank you because they actually enjoy being negative. So only deal with them if you absolutely have to. Way number three is to keep a positive outlook yourself. Like attracts like, and whether we like it or not, we attract into our lives people, events, and situations that mirror our internal state of mind. So, how do you feel on a regular basis? Are you feeling happy, excited, grateful, loving? Or are you feeling irritable, judgmental, negative, and frustrated? You know, keep those feelings in check. Way number four is don't overanalyze the situation. Negative people can sometimes behave irrationally, and you'll waste valuable time and energy if you try to make sense of all their actions. So do whatever you can to prevent yourself from becoming emotionally invested in their issues. Way number five, let go of your own need to complain. Take responsibility for your own emotions and state of being. Don't go around complaining about how much other people's negativity is affecting you, because this will only create more negativity. Assume responsibility for your own thoughts and feelings and see what you can do to feel better, what you can do to change the current situation by changing your lenses, by changing your attitude and by changing the way that you look at things. 
Finally, stop listening to that irrational voice in your own head that's constantly doing you down and telling you what you can't do. When you start taking a more positive attitude, you'll find that your life and mood will improve by the same proportions. So, what do you want? Now, I know that sounds a really simplistic question, but it's one that a lot of people have difficulty answering. Because if you don't know what you want, how will you know when you've got it? And this is something that all too often gets overlooked because it's assumed that we already know this. How many motivational posters tell you things like, Go after the one thing that makes you truly happy, or never give up on your dreams. Well, this is fine if you've always wanted to open your own restaurant, or if you've always dreamed of having your own rock band, or some other really long-held ambition that you've always wanted to fulfil. But what if you don't know what you want from life? What if you have lots of different interests that are pulling you in different directions? In these cases, telling someone to seize the day and live their dreams just isn't all that helpful. What you need to do in these cases is prioritise and look for the things you can get from life that will make you happiest and tick the most boxes. Now, let's look at some of the ways that you can do that. Very often... What this comes down to is identifying the common themes in your dreams and objectives. Now, in other words, if you want to be 20 things, what do those 20 things have in common? So, if you want to be an actor and a rock star, what is it about both those things that makes them appealing? What does being a rock star have in common with being an actor? Well, the most likely answer is that both put you in the public eye and both are a kind of performance which can bring a certain amount of adoration. So, as long as you can tick all those boxes, you should be happy whatever you do. Another way to get to the bottom of what it is that you really want and to discover why you want it is to use the five whys technique. Here, you ask yourself the question why five times in a row in order to dig deeper and deeper into your motivations. So, let's say you want to be a famous novelist like J.K. Rowling or Thomas Hardy. Why? Because you want to create something that you can be proud of. Why? Because you want to leave a lasting mark. Why? Because you respect and admire creative individuals who've done the same. Why? Because they can make a living by entertaining using only their imagination and their writing skills. Why does that appeal? Because you love to write and to be acknowledged for your creativity. OK, now we're getting somewhere. Perhaps it's not being a novelist specifically that appeals to you so much as being able to write and to get credit for your creativity. And this opens up a world of possibilities. You could be an article writer, or a screenwriter, or a newspaper columnist, or a blogger. You know, the list just goes on and on. Another way to find out what it is you really want is to look at your role models and see what it is about them that you admire. Which parts of their lives would you like to emulate? What do they have in common? Another tip is to look back at what you wanted to be when you were younger. Now, sometimes this will have no bearing because we can change an awful lot in a few decades. But in other cases, you'll find that whatever it is that you wanted to be back then still has some kind of appeal for you. Now, back then, you probably dreamed of being something much more ambitious and less realistic because, let's face it, we do all get a bit more cynical as we get older. And sometimes, when you look back at what you wanted to do when you were young, you think, what a silly idea. But, you know, there might still be some sort of a nucleus of something that you could perhaps salvage from that. 
And does that same thing still excite you? Once again, think of what it is about that thing that appeals and how you could realistically achieve the same end. For example, if you couldn't make it as a basketball player, perhaps you've got what it takes to be a coach. You're still involved in basketball, just in a different way. So think about what you want and then brainstorm your goals. Write them down and place them somewhere that you can see them. Then work backwards from your goal to where you are now. And this is very important. It's a very important technique to start with the end and then work back to the beginning because then you'll know exactly what you need to accomplish to get to the next stage. And you'll find it easier to stay motivated if you break your goals down into smaller goals that you can achieve easily. And once you've achieved one goal, you can move on to the next one until you've achieved your ultimate aim. Something that I personally have found very useful when trying to work through goals and trying to come up with ideas and brainstorming sessions and that sort of thing is to use mind mapping software. And the one that I like to use is called FreeMind and it is actually a free piece of software that you can download. And I can just see here on the uh, on the website they've got some screenshots that show you exactly how it works and what it all looks like and how you can work through the various uh, mind maps that you can use the software for. And you can find out more at freemind.sourceforge.net and you can download the software for free.